you pray with me? Worthy. Worthy. Mm. Lord, while we are so oftentimes worthless, we are reminded that you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Today we are in Job chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, and I have a strong suspicion that we don't need a fancy story or cute illustration to begin with today, because we can all very easily relate to what it feels like to be broken. (coughs) Let me just ask you, by show of hands, how many of you at some point, at some time, in some way or another, in your life have ever felt crushed or ever felt like you were at the end of your rope, totally broken and shattered? Anybody else or just me? That's what I thought. Your story won't be the same as Job's. Your story, if we took time to hear them all, wouldn't be the same as mine. But we all know what it's like to be broken, to feel crushed. Let me start with the good news this morning. You made it. You're still here. (laughs) Amen. Tell somebody sitting next to you, you made it. Amen. You made it. And can I just tell you, Job's going to make it too. He's going to make it. But in Job chapter 3, he's not real sure. It probably doesn't feel like, here in Job 3, Job probably doesn't feel like he's going to make it. And and here in Job's text, in this text we call the book of Job, we're making a transition in chapter 3. It's here we start to see the brokenness of Job bubbling up and coming to the surface. We start to feel the desperation in his life, the desperation that is setting in. For those of you who haven't been with us for the first five sermons in this series, let me just quickly remind you of who Job is and what he's been through. Job had ten grown children. He was a rich man, a respected man. He was, more importantly even than all of those things, a righteous man of God. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it says that his his estate included 7,000 sheep and goats, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke, of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large number of servants. And then here's the most important part. It says, Job was the greatest man among all the people of the East. He was a righteous man, a good man. And then in a single day, he loses everything. The devil is working against Job. He takes everything from him, including his 10 children, who all die at the same time on the same day that he loses everything else in his life. It's absolutely devastating news. It's crushing news. And the Bible tells us that Job's initial response, we read it in verse 20 of chapter 1, is this. It says, Then Job stood up when he heard all of this. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. He wanted to look like me, I guess. He fell to the ground, and it says this. He worshipped saying, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says, throughout all of this, Job did not sin, and he did not blame God for anything. Unfortunately, this isn't where the the trial of Job ends. It gets even worse in chapter 2, as we discovered. Because up to this point, at the end of chapter 1, Job has lost everything, but he's still healthy. In Job chapter 2, the Bible says, starting in verse 7, that Satan left the Lord's presence and infected Job with terrible boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself while he sat among the ashes. Last week, we talked about Job's three friends who show up on the scene. 
who arrive at the end of chapter 2 in an effort to comfort and help and sympathize with their friend. And when they arrived, they, they could not even recognize their friend due to the poor condition of his physical health. In verse 13 it says, for example, then they sat on the ground with him seven days and nights, but no one spoke a word to him because they saw that his suffering was very intense. Job is crushed, broken, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, in every possible way you can imagine. Job's life feels like chaos. It feels like it's, it's a, just one big catastrophe. So for an entire week, these friends, they sit with Job in silence. And this is where we pick up today in chapter 3. This chapter leads us into the conversations that take place throughout the remaining or most of the rain, remaining book of Job. Conversations between Job and his three friends who will each take turns speaking and Job will take turns replying to each of them. And his words here are much different. His words in chapter 3 as Job begins to speak are much different than what we heard last time we heard from Job. Where Job was saying things like, blessed be the name of the Lord. Or in Job chapter 2 verse 10 where he said, should we accept only good from God and not adversity. Where he's at least dealing with this on some level. In chapter 3 we find a broken man. And yet a man who remains unwaveringly faithful to God, even in his brokenness. We also find what I believe we might term or call the blessings of brokenness. It's easy when we're in a state of brokenness to think that it's all bad. But can I just tell you, church, there are some blessings inside of our brokenness that we often miss because the brokenness is so great. And I'm not sure Job saw these in his life originally, but we can see them because we have hindsight and we can unpack this and we have a full picture. And, and my prayer is this, my prayer is, is that because we just raised our hands a moment ago and we've all been broken and we'll probably be broken again before this life is over, my prayer is, is that if we take a little time to examine this, maybe next time we're in a state of brokenness, we'll see the blessings there. Let's read a little bit of Job's story. Job 3. Starting in verse 1, it says, After this, after those seven days of silence with his friends, it says, Job began to speak, and he cursed the day he was born. He said, May the day I was born perish, and the night that said, A boy is conceived. If only that day had turned to darkness, may God above not care about it or light shine on it. May darkness and gloom reclaim it and a cloud settle over it. May what darkens the day terrify it. If only darkness had taken that night away. May it not appear among the days of the year or be listed in the calendar. Yes, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout be heard in it. Do you hear the brokenness of this man? Jump down to verse 24 towards the end of the chapter where... Job says this, he says, I sigh when food is put before me, and my groans pour out like water, for the thing I feared has overtaken me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I cannot relax or be calm. I have no rest, for turmoil has come. In Job's story of brokenness here, we're reminded of this truth, this big idea, if you will. You might be broken, but if you're a believer, a disciple, a follower of God, as Job was, you might be broken, but you cannot be beaten. You might be broken, but you cannot be beaten if you are one of God's children. I want you to see inside of this chapter 3 of Job's story the blessings of brokenness with me today. Number one is this, first point is this, we we have to see this, brokenness is common. It's everywhere. So many times we convince ourselves that what we're going through is unique. (laughs) And we're the only one who's ever been broken. That we're the only one who's ever struggled. That we're the only one who's ever suffered. That we're the only one who has ever faced this kind of adversity, whatever it might be. And in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our hurt, in the middle of our heartache, 
in the middle of our, our brokenness, when we are crushed, it can just feel like we're all alone and we're the only ones who have ever felt that way in the history of humanity. Can I just tell you that's not true? As you just saw a moment ago when I asked you to raise your hand, I, I didn't see a single person in here who didn't raise their hand. We've all felt crushed. We've all felt broken. We've all been there because brokenness is a part of this life. It's a part of this life due to sin. It's a part of the world we live in due to sin. Sin, that's what it produces. It produces brokenness. And all sin affects all of humanity. Therefore, brokenness affects us all. In Romans 3.23, it says, For we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've, we've all sinned, and therefore there's brokenness around and inside of all of us. So anytime we're in a state of brokenness, we should use that as a reminder that the world is broken and that brokenness is common in our sinful world. Eliphaz, one of Job's three friends, says this in chapter 5 about the suffering and the trouble that finds us all. He just makes this statement in verse 7. He says, But humans are born for trouble as surely as sparks fly upward from a fire. He said, just, just as surely as you're sitting around a fire and you see the embers floating into the air, so trouble is going to come to our lives. It's common. In Job chapter 14, Job even makes this observation in verses 1 and 2. He says, anyone born of a woman, by the way, that's everyone. Amen? Amen. Anyone born of a woman, let me say it again, that's everyone, Amen. is short of days and full of trouble, Job says. Because brokenness and trouble and heartache and hardship is common to us all. He goes on in verse 2 and he says, he blossoms like a flower then withers he flees like a shadow and does not last. The psalmist knew this to be true. We could quote countless psalms that recount this same idea, but just for the sake of time, I'll just give you Psalm 34, 17, and 18. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. Look at verse 18. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and he saves those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. He's near the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. And we're all there at some point in our lives. Church, brokenness is far too common in our world. I'll agree with you on that. I wish it wasn't so. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish we could fix all the brokenness and take away all the heartache and all the hardship. But we can't. It's common. If you're broken, you're not alone. If you're hurting, you're not alone. If you're suffering, you're not alone. If you're sick, you're not alone. In the New Testament, Peter said this in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. He said, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes along or comes among you to test you. As if something unusual were happening to you. This is common. He's, that's the point he's getting at. This is normal. Even though in the moment it might feel unique, and even though in the moment it might feel abnormal, it's actually very, very normal. The reality is, this happens. Even Jesus told us we would have suffering in places like John 16, 33. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, I have conquered the world. Jesus is saying, you might be broken because that's pretty common. That's going to happen, but you can't be beaten. He says, I give you peace, and I give you the confidence to conquer it because I've already conquered it for you. There's a blessing in knowing that whatever brokenness we're experiencing in our life, whatever hardship or heartache has come into us or around us, or feels like it's overtaking us, there's a blessing in knowing we're not alone in our brokenness and understanding that it is common. Number two, we need to understand that brokenness confronts our limits. And this is a blessing. It's, it's one of the hardest things about brokenness, but it's also a blessing 
Because brokenness pushes us into places we would never go otherwise. When you're broken, when you're crushed, when you're, you're in those moments, man, you, you are forced, unwillingly, but you are forced into dealing with stuff. You're very quickly pushed to the limits of life. Job certainly feels this way. In verse 23 of chapter 3, Job says, Why is life given to a man whose path is hidden, whom God has hedged in? He feels like he's boxed in with nowhere to go. He feels like he's at the end of his rope. He's reached his absolute limit. Later in chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, he says, What strength do I have? that I should continue to hope? What is my future that I should be patient? Is my strength that of a stone or my flesh made of bronze? Since I cannot help myself, the hope for success has been banished from me. In chapter 30, he laments, starting in verse 16, Now my life is poured out before me, and days of suffering have seized me. Night pierces my bones, but my gnawing pains never rest. Throughout his great suffering, he's pushed to the limit in every possible way. He remains unwaveringly faithful to God despite getting out there to the limits. But our times of brokenness in our lives take us to the limit of what we can endure. But it's there at our limit that we experience the love and the grace and the comfort of God the most. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When he felt broken and felt like he had reached his limit, when he felt like he was out there at the end of his rope and had all he could ever handle, it was there in that great text that's so memorable to so many of us that Paul proclaims what Jesus said to him, which was this, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. And Paul goes on to say, Therefore I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that in Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties for the sake of Christ. He says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Church, I want to remind you again that with God and in Christ and with the help of the Holy Spirit, you might be broken, but you cannot be beaten. You might get pushed to the very limit of what you can take and what you can handle, but you can't be beaten or defeated because our victory is assured in Jesus. Going out to the limit is a blessing because it's there we get to experience God going to the limit with us. There's a third blessing of our brokenness. It contributes to our testimony. For those of you who raised your hand back at the beginning a moment ago and I asked you if you had ever felt totally crushed or broken, I bet that season of your life has some part of it inside of your testimony about the goodness of God the grace of God, the glory of God. Brokenness is no fun. (laughs) Brokenness is not something we seek. Brokenness is not something we want in our life. Brokenness, for those of us who are good and righteous people, brokenness is not something we would even wish on our enemies. But brokenness is something God can use. In Job chapter 3, we see this man in the middle of a mess, in the middle of this brokenness, And listen to what he says a few chapters later in Job 19, 25 through 27. He says, But I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand on the dust, even after my skin has been destroyed. Yet I will see God in my flesh. I will see him myself. My eyes will look at him, and not as a stranger. My heart longs within me. This time of sorrow, this time of sadness, this time of pain and hardship and brokenness leads Job to a place 
where he's able to share a testimony of hope, a testimony of love, a testimony of the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. Don't ever forget that the first four letters of testimony are test. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-7. through 7. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Verse 4, He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance in the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that as you share in the sufferings, you will also share in the comfort. See, God can use your time and your season of brokenness to comfort someone else through your testimony. God can use your brokenness and your season of that to be a part of your testimony that becomes a part of somebody else's life somewhere down the road. In fact, I bet that during your time of brokenness, that time you thought of a moment ago when you said, yeah, that's me, I'm with you, I've been broken. I bet somebody came along in that time and shared part of their testimony with you to encourage you, didn't they? I bet somewhere in that story, somebody came along and said, hey, you know what, I went through something like that one time. And I remember this is how I got through it or this is what helped me. God used their brokenness to help you in the midst of yours, and God now can use your brokenness to help somebody else in the midst of theirs. Even in our brokenness, there can be a purpose. Even in our brokenness, there can be a blessing. Even in our brokenness, we can be used by God. It reminds me of the saints that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. These brothers and sisters, my friends... Oh, Mm. they are going to be pushed to the limit in the last days. But I want you to see what this text says. Look and see what this text says about them and their test and their brokenness and what they're going to go through. It says in Revelation 12, 9 through 11, So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, The one who deceives the whole world, he was thrown to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. And then look at verse 11, it says, they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their what testimony they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they did not love their lives to the point of death you see church the bigger the test the stronger the testimony Your brokenness and my brokenness will not feel like a blessing to us in the midst of it. I get that. I'm not saying it will. But don't ever discount how God might use your brokenness in the life of somebody else. Here's another thing that happens. Point number four. Our brokenness clarifies our priorities. When life is going good, when everything is right when everything is just cruising along, it's easy to get your priorities mixed up, amen? That's when we get mixed up. That, that's when we start doing things we shouldn't. That's when we start living the way we shouldn't. That's when we start spending money on things we shouldn't. When, when everything is going right, that's when so many times we get it wrong. But when things get hard, when things get tough, when suffering comes, when brokenness sets in, 
our priorities get really focused really fast, don't they? We see this start to happen in Job's life just after he loses everything in Job chapter 1. His priorities, all of a sudden, they, they just come into focus. In verse 20, it says, Then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. He said, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His priorities were all of a sudden just brought into perfect clarity for him. In the middle of his brokenness, he is convicted of what really matters in his life. We see him address it again in places like Job 31, 24 through 28, where he says, If I place my confidence in gold, or called fine gold my trust, if I have rejoiced because my wealth is great or because my own hand has acquired so much, if I have gazed at the sun when it was shining or at the moon moving in splendor so that my heart was secretly enticed and I threw them a kiss, this also would be an iniquity deserving punishment for I would have denied God above. See, Job seems to have had his priorities in order even before his brokenness came. He says, even before I was broken, I wasn't trusting in my gold. I wasn't trusting in my flocks. I wasn't trusting in my servants. I, I wasn't worshiping the sun or the moon. I didn't do any of that. But it's here in the middle of his suffering as he's reflecting on everything in his life, his priorities and choices come into even clearer focus. Things are very clear for him in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the brokenness. Church, we need to make sure that our priorities are right before we're broken. That, that's always best. We should get our priorities right every day of our life. We shouldn't wait around until we go through a season of brokenness or a season of suffering to start getting things right in our life. Remember, we, we started this whole series by saying Job had everything right before everything went wrong. That's good of Job, but things still went wrong. And even in the middle of his brokenness and in the middle of it going wrong, he's able to clarify down even more into what really matters. The New Testament says this about how we should think about our priorities in life. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 is an example of it. So if you have been raised with Christ, this is for believers, disciples, people who worship the living God, who believe he is the worthy lamb. If that's you, he says, seek things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. He says, set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died and your life was hidden with Christ in God. And then he says in verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, that's your priority. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul, in the middle of his own suffering and brokenness in a Roman prison, told the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, but everything that was a gain to me, I've considered it a loss because of Christ. He says, more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss. In the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, because of him I have suffered the loss of all things, and I consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ. And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. He knew where his priorities were. Somehow, even in that prison, that was able to be clarified even more. He said, anything I've ever gained, I consider it a loss. I consider it dung. I consider it rubbish. Christ and his kingdom should be the priority of all disciples all the time. Christ and his kingdom should be the priority of all churches all the time. Christ and his kingdom should be the priority over everything else in our lives all the time. I promise you, when you come to a place of brokenness, nothing else will matter 
And your priorities will get really clear really fast. So why wait until then? Why not go ahead and get your priorities right right now? It's really not hard to see where your priorities are. A few quick little simple things you can do to see where your priorities are. Three questions you can ask yourself. Simple questions, not hard questions, not raise your hand questions, not come tell me about it after church questions. These are you go home and you talk to God about it questions, amen? Here they are. Number one, what am I spending time on? Where's my time going? Wherever your time is going, that's a priority in your life. What are you spending time on? Number two, what am I spending money on? Look at your checkbook. That'll tell you where your priorities are really fast. I know y'all don't have checkbooks. Look at your bank statement. (laughs) It shows what you're swiping your debit and credit cards on. Whatever you're spending money on is your priority. It's what's taking your time, what's taking your money, and then lastly, what's taking your energy? What are you thinking about? What are you praying about? What are you dwelling about? What are you focusing on? What what is sucking energy out of you? Whatever that is, is a priority in your life. You answer those three questions, you will very quickly be able to see where the priorities are in your life. What you're spending your time on, what you're spending your money on, and what you're spending your energy on. Simple. Brokenness has a way of clarifying what is most important to us in life and revealing what our priorities are and what they should be. Don't wait around until your brokenness has to come and slap you in the face to get your priorities right. Just get them right now. And here's the last one, the one I want to close with. And the biggest blessing of all brokenness. You see, brokenness is a a blessing because brokenness connects us to Christ. It's in our brokenness, in our hardship, in our pain, in our heartache, in our sufferings, in our adversities in life that we are able to identify with, relate to, and experience the love of Christ the most. There's just something about those seasons of brokenness that draw us into a closer, deeper, more real relationship with the Lord. We can't deny that Job is broken in chapter 3, but look at what he says in chapter 13. In chapter 13, verse 13, he says, Be quiet and I will speak. Let whatever comes happen to me. I will put myself at risk and take my life in my own hands. Even if he kills me, I will hope in him. I will still defend my ways before him. Yes, this will result in my deliverance, for no godless person can appear before him. His brokenness produced an extreme and very intense confidence in God. Brokenness has a unique way of doing that. Again, we see... This through the New Testament. Look, for example, at Romans chapter 8, and verse 16, where it says, The Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, look at this last part, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. There's something about suffering and brokenness that connects us to Christ. We suffer with Him and we'll be glorified with Him, Paul says. To the Philippians, he wrote this in chapter 1, verse 29, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Church, have you ever heard that before? It has been granted to you, disciples of Jesus, on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in Him. Good for you for doing that. Not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Since you are engaged, he says, in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. 
It's common where we started today, right? Struggle, suffering, hardship, persecution, difficulties, chaos, brokenness, adversity. It's common. It's everywhere. And you know what? It connects us to Jesus. It's that very thing that makes our faith so very real and puts us in this deep, meaningful relationship with the Lord. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if some unusual thing were happening to you. Instead, he says, rejoice. Rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when His glory is revealed. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory in God rests on you. In 1 Peter 5, 10-11, it says, The God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To Him be dominion forever. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, in a few weeks, we're going to gather together to hear actual testimonies from actual believers just like you and just like me, our brothers and sisters, who have been beaten, thrown in prison, watched their loved ones burned, We're going to hear from people who have been run out of their villages, lost everything. We're going to hear people who left their families and lost their families completely. We're going to hear from people who've lost their jobs and any ability to go get a new one because they found Jesus. We're going to hear from people who found themselves in the most desperate moments of life and have experienced a brokenness like you and I probably never will. But you're going to also hear them tell you about how that brokenness brought them closer to the Lord and how it increased their faith in Him. Because there's just something about suffering and brokenness that connects us to Christ in a very special way. You, you might be in a place of brokenness right now, Maybe when you raised your hand at the beginning, you were saying, hey, that wasn't a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago. That's right now for me. I just want to remind you one more time, you might be broken today, but you cannot be beaten. Jesus loves you. God sent his son, Jesus, to die for you. We take comfort in these words of Paul when he reminds us in Romans chapter 8, When he says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You might be broken. It's common. It's everywhere. But you cannot be beaten. If you have never experienced the love and the grace and the mercy of God, if you have never repented of your sins and given your life to Him, I pray you would do that today. Many times we have to come to a place of brokenness before we can clearly see how bad our sin is and how great our need of God's grace is. Maybe you're there right now in your life and you just need to repent and believe. We're not going to ask you to come to the front or to raise a hand. We're not going to ask you to stand up. We're not going to do the whole every head bowed and every eye closed thing. We're just going to ask you to do what the Bible asks you to do, which is come before the throne of God, (coughs) repent, and believe. And I pray that if you feel broken today, you will leave here at least with the confidence of knowing you cannot be beaten. Because God is with you. He is for you, not against you. And he has a great plan for your life. And he even has a great plan for your brokenness. Even if, like Job, you can't see that today.
Let's pray. If that's you and you've never called on the Lord for salvation, we invite you to do so right now. Just pray with us there where you are. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. I ask by faith that you would forgive me and save me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for your love and for your mercy. Father, as we close this time, we, though we don't want to say it, and though it is hard to say, Lord, and though it doesn't even sound like it makes sense when we go to say it, Lord, we thank you for our brokenness. Not because we want more of it, Father, not because we want to go through it again, but because even in the middle of brokenness, there is blessing. Because you are so worthy and so good and so right and so victorious and so powerful, Lord, that even when we're broken, we cannot be beaten. Father, we are so grateful for our brokenness because it reminds us in such a real and raw way of how connected we are to you and your kingdom. Father, I pray for those who are in a state of brokenness this hour. Whether it's a relationship or a marriage or finances, Father, or whether it's something at work or something at home. Maybe it's something inside of them that nobody else can see. Maybe everything on the outside looks perfect, but inside they are just crushed. Lord, I know you can see it. Father, I pray that you would touch it that you would speak into it. And Father, that you would give them the confidence to know that even here in the middle of this brokenness, they are not beaten because you love them and care for them. Father, we thank you. And we will end now where we began earlier and just say, you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is our God on high. Worthy is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. Worthy is our Redeemer. Worthy. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. Uh, leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.